This conference will now be recorded. Perfect. Okay, thank you. And let's slide down. There we go. Thank you. So uh, real quickly, we have three presenters. This is on uh, the Landfill Operations Series. Uh, today's um, Swan Goldberg's Chapter of Vision 2020 webinar series is going to cover a lot of territory. So hold on to your hats. Here's the quick introduction. Andy Chung has um, over 20 years of environmental experience, ranging from field work, operations, management, sales, and so on. His work with, uh, with Western Geosystems is focused on primarily on finding solutions for um, drainage, gas collection, reclamation, and a variety of other things that are challenging the environmental of a landfill site. Uh, he's the first talk, uh, speaker. Uh, Mark Welch of Caterpillar is essentially father time for, for, uh, for Caterpillar. His 45-year career span from laborer, sales, marketing, and management. Um, before most of you were born, back in 1977, he began working in the landfill group, a newly formed uh, entity that Caterpillar started on just focusing on landfill, which, by the way, that was before SWANA. That was in the GRCDA days, as I recall. Uh, he's traveled the world. He has uh, 55 different countries. He's been to 2,000 landfills. He's got a lot of stuff to tell us, and we're really appreciative of him being here to tell us that before he retires. Eric Miller is uh, manages the Butte County Public Works Department Division of Waste and Recycling, um, located in Oroville, uh, and he is based out of the New World Landfill. Uh, he's going to tell us um, about his 30. Well, he's compared to Mark, he's a young pup at 32 years in the field, but he's going to talk to us about what happened. Um, at the uh, at the Neil Rowe landfill, uh, following the uh, the campfire, which would destroy the city of Paradise and its surrounding area. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to Andy, and he'll begin our presentation uh, right away. Thanks, Tim. Let me uh, fire this up here. All right, hopefully hopefully everyone can uh, see my screen here. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Andy Young with Western Geosystems. Today we'll, we'll be presenting two case studies on the use of multilinear drainage geocomposite for landfill gas collection. The uh, somewhat new product here in the US and when properly designed and installed is very effective at collecting landfill gases, both beneath the liner as part of a cover system or within the waste mass. So for those of you who have to deal with landfill gas collection, I hope you find this presentation to be of interest, and thanks again for your time. So over the next 12 minutes, I will be uh, covering um, the brief introduction, product description, design elements, things to consider, working with uh, geo, uh, geocomposites, the two case studies, and then briefly touch on other applications. So uh, I'm the uh, founding principal with Western Geosystems. Um, I represent a variety of manufacturers, primarily geosynthetics, to provide engineered environmental solutions reducing the use of natural resources uh, for landfill and mining projects. So in my role here, I represent a SETCO. We're replacing that two feet of compacted clay with the geosynthetic clay liner. With drain tube, which is what I'll be talking about now, we're replacing crushed gravel or sand as a drainage or gas collection layer. And then Profile Products has a, a product biotic soil media where we can actually hydraulically apply organic matter and beneficial biota instead of trucking in topsoil we can actually build it on site and through all these uh, technologies we reduce cost speed construction improve safety as mentioned uh, drainage geocomposites uh, work to replace sand or gravel in civil or environmental applications this avoids the mining transporting placing of the sand or gravel and the reclaim of the uh, borrow sources greenhouse gas reductions up to 87 percent can be achieved with these uh this family of products and um, ASTM recognizes four types of geocomposites. We follow under the uh, multilinear drainage geocomposite family. So uh, a quick snapshot of what the product looks like. Um, it's essentially a perforated polypropylene mini pipes between two geotextile layers. Um, it's a pretty neat product and it's very scalable. Um, we can change the pipe diameter to increase or decrease the gas flow. Likewise, we can increase or decrease the pipe spacing um, one pipe per two meters or as many as four pipes per meter, depending upon the transmissivity or gas flow that we're looking for. This product has been manufactured in, for over 30 years in Europe. Uh, if you were to do a design there, this is kind of the proven technology as opposed to like more traditional geocomposites we see here in the US. And we've been manufacturing here in North America for over 10 years up in Canada. Um, moving on to the design elements, things to consider when you're uh, working with uh, these types of products is on uh, the numerator there on the right, you've got your flow rate. That's your transmissivity as the product comes out of the factory, um, right off the factory floor. But 
in reality, there's going to be reduction factors as uh, identified by, by uh, Kerner in the GSI white paper number four. So you've got your, your creep, um, which is basically the, the, the net being compressed under load or over time. Intrusion, which is the uh, geotextile or geomembrane being pushed into the, the net. And then chemical clogging and biological clogging. So we'll take a look at these factors here. Um, here's a picture of a traditional biplanar or triplanar uh, geocomposite. And uh, as you can see, as you uh, increase the normal loads, you're going to decrease your transmissivity. And that's just a function of the, uh, of the uh, geotextile being forced into the uh, core of the, of the product. Um, likewise, looking at uh, creep curves um, for the 10,000 hour ASTM test, you'll see a reduction in thickness of the uh, core, which has a corresponding reduction in gas flow or transmissivity. Um, more increase the higher the normal loads as expected. Contrast that with the, uh, um, the drain tube product, which uh, you'll get a soil arching effect around the pipe, much like you would any other um, perforated pipe in a landfill gas collection system. Um, so as such, we're essentially immune to um, intrusion because the geotextiles aren't going to force their way into these tiny perforations. Um, as you can see here, all the way up to 50,000 PSF, um, essentially flat or very little change in transmissivity as we increase the load. Similar story to tell over time. Um, you can increase the, you know, as you continue to, you know, test over time, you know, you're very stable, so very little change or no change in transmissivity over time. Um, next, we want to look at chemical clogging and biological clogging, especially for a leachate collection. That's a, a, a critical importance. Um, so we partnered with uh, Dr. George Kerner with uh, GRI. Um, this is uh, George in front of a, a shed at a waste management landfill out in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so he put together a three-year study where he basically just gravity-fed the uh, product um, through, or the leachate rather, through various products. Here's the uh, results of the uh, three-year study by uh, Dr. Kerner. So you can see this red line is uh, non-woven needle punched with GeoNet. Um, so after three years, he had observed about a 70% reduction in flow compared to the uh, non-woven needle punched with tube, which had about a 25% reduction in flow over the three-year study. So as, as a result of this, the ASTM committees and the GRI uh, organization, you know, authorized in 2017 for the drain tube product to meet all the applicable ASTM standards. Um, so kind of summarizing up how these products compare under load. So here are... Um, Standard double-sided 250 mil geonet compared to a, uh, a drain tube, uh, one pipe per meter, 20 millimeter diameter pipes. So you see coming out of the factory, they're identical. You start adding in intrusion and then creep and then biological clogging and chemical clogging. And uh, so you'll see on this uh, logarithmic uh, chart here, about four times higher long-term drainage capacity. So as a result of, of this study and others, the uh, um, ASTM standard guide for specifying drainage geocomposites included the, uh, the following statement that some products like multilinear drainage geocomposites may not be sensitive to creep when confined into a soil matrix because of their core structures. So pretty good story to tell as far as uh, uh, durability and uh, long-term performance in uh, landfill applications. So I realized that was a, a lot of information we just presented in those uh, charts and uh, um, but this is all summarized in the attached references. Feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to get a copy of uh, any of these studies or technical papers. So moving on to the fun stuff, the uh, case studies. Um, this was a, a project that we did last year. This is a private landfill north of Los Angeles, um, right next to the interstate there. Um, so this uh, landfill, they reached out to us because they were having some issues with uh, odor mitigation concerns. Um, in 2012, they were uh, hit with a class action lawsuit by the neighboring communities uh, related to odor complaints. Um, and uh, they reached out to us looking for a cost-effective gas collection and extraction method, um, you know, trying to avoid, you know, further consequences from these uh, class action lawsuits. So we worked with the uh, client's internal technical team, as well as their consultant, Geologic Associates, and Associates and we recommended the use of a multilinear uh, drainage geocomposite to collect these fugitive landfill gases. So we ultimately we selected the uh, drain tube 303P FT4 D25 product. So a little bit about the nomenclature. So that's two three ounce non-woven geotextiles, so relatively thin geotextile configuration. Um, but you know we didn't really need thicker geotextiles for cushioning or any other um, properties, filter properties, etc. So we just went with two thin 
weight geotextiles, FT4, so that's four pipes per meter. Um, we really thought we could get away with one or two pipes per meter, but the client um, wanted to, you know, just go with, you know, get as much flow as possible. So we went with the uh, four pipes per meter and D25, so that's 25 millimeter diameter compared to the smaller 20 millimeter diameter option. Um, of interesting note, so on this one up here at the uh, crest of this slope, um, we used a, a, a non-perforated mini pipes to tie into the product and we use these T-connects um, to basically we wanted to reduce the number of, of fittings going into the header pipes. We wanted to reduce the uh, the head loss. Um, so we're, you know, pretty, that worked out really well in our favor. Um, and also, you know, because this is a non-perforated section here, you know, we're not pulling air into the system on the on the crest, you know, we're pulling vacuum on the whole um, slope here, which is what we wanted to do. Um, here's just a couple of pictures of the uh, product being installed. So it just rolls out like a standard uh, geotextile. You can have your little spaghetti here before we uh, got it all cleaned up and tied into the uh, header uh, pipe. Um, so we we're able to get it on site quickly, safe and efficient installation. My colleague Rob Stafford with Western Geosystems based in Reno um, went down to the site, made sure the installer um, um, DNE, you know, had didn't have any questions. It went in well. And we got a nice little testimonial from the site environmental manager that the product and design are meeting our expectations. We are very pleased with their performance. Moving on to the next case study. Um, so and this is different. So that was placed underneath the liner. So they put a liner on top of that last case study. This one was up in uh, King County, um, up in Washington, where uh, the engineer wanted to look at some different options for landfill gas collection kind of within the waste mass. So on the left here, you got your typical, um, you know, more traditional method where you trench in, put in a perforated pipe and gravel around it, you know, versus, you know, the what they call the mini tube blanket in this study. Um, looks like, looks like some slides dropped out. Um, I'm not sure what's going on here, Cecilia, but um, there, the results, um, suffice to say, were, were, were good. Um, they did a, an alternative version, a conventional version, and then the drain tube version. They ran each one for about two weeks, and uh, the drain tube exceeded um, by about 50% the uh, um, collection from the uh, other two, you know, the conventional and then the alternate conventional design. Um, so I'm sorry that those two slides aren't showing up here. Um, and then, you know, just for grins, the uh, engineer did some back of the envelope calculations, just looking at cost savings from airspace. So just avoiding the trenching and gravel, you know, he estimated we're saving about $4,500 for 100 linear feet of, of trench. So my apologies, a couple of slides were left out there. Um, it was basically just pictures of dials and the, the, the um, vacuum gauges that we used, the engineer used to, to monitor on that one. And then um, lastly, um, we'll wrap up. Um, on time here. Other applications could be leachate collection, rainfall drainage, or leak detection. Here's just a uh, landfill in Western Colorado where we're rolling out the product at the bottom of a small landfill cell for leachate collection. Um, rainfall drainage on landfill cover. So if you have a, a geomembrane cap um, and you're worried about pore pressure building up in the cover soils and potential sloughing or, or sliding of the cover soil, um, add some sort of drainage layer right on top of the membrane. So it can definitely help with that. And then gas venting, Leak detection for ponds, you can roll strips out underneath the pond to avoid whales and balloons. Um, and then we also have a conductive version. Um, for example, if you're doing a double line pond, we can use this as a, uh, a leak detection layer between two geomembranes. Um, and it's compatible with a variety of uh, water puddle, spark test, dipole test methods. Um, here's just an operator um, doing a, one of those uh, leak location surveys out at a site. So by my clock, I'm at 11 minutes and 24 seconds. So came in under the wire um, and uh, do want to thank you for your attention. I'm not sure if we have any time for questions, but my contact info is on the screen if you'd like to uh, follow up with me. And thanks again for your time today. Greatly appreciated. Thank you, Andy. And uh, there aren't any questions on the chat room, so we're going to go right into hearing from Mark. Um, and if we can get his up, I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, by the way, for keeping your your mic muted, that's very much and I very much appreciate it. Do you see it? Is my screen up? Not yet, Mark. No.
nothing, huh? I got it on, and am I sharing? Do I have? We see your camera, but we're not hearing you yet, or not seeing your your images yet. So you want to bring up the uh, the backup slide deck? Well, hang on a second. I, I'm not sure what's going on. It was working fine a minute ago, right? Uh, Mark, if you there's a button at the bottom for screen uh, right. next to the red X. Do you want to try that? Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, I can always share for you. There you go. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we see your screen, and now you can you bring can the presentation up. Yeah, and we hear you. Great. Man, I don't know what's going on here. Let me get the well, screen show screen, going. So you may have just picked the wrong screen. If you have two screens, you're sharing okay. your, it looks like your uh, screen saver. Why don't you share with us your presentation? Oh, am I sharing? Hang on. Mm -hmm. I've got, yeah, my That's monitor it. here. Now full, full scale it and then click on presentation, lower right corner. Yep, that's it. Okay, and then I moved this by accident. So I am in presentation <laughs> mode then, right? Uh, no, not uh, yeah, you are. Well, no, no, the, the lower right corner, um, there's a little arrow. Yeah, that's it. Click on that, and you're in presentation mode when you click on it. Yeah, I am, but it's All right, too, go for it. That's okay. And it's you're showing good. up that way. You're good. Let's go ahead and run. Okay. Away. All right, well, let me try to get through here and tell me because I can't tell on my screen. I'm just going to go off of my slides here. So what is the highest cost of operating a sanitary landfill? Well, in this country, pretty much everybody knows it's the equipment cost. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that what happens when this gets out of control. Um, you've got to make sure you're choosing the correct machine for the operation you're on hand. And we all know that again, um, sometimes it slips away, but uh, first and foremost in every landfill in this country and most of the established developed world, everybody's got to handle the waste and they want to compact it. That's number one, you got to push the waste out of the way. Secondary is you want to cover them, you want to cover it up, whether it's soil and you know, you're going to need excavation, loading, hauling, spreading, whatever, and then support and maintenance equipment to run a good landfill. You're going to see the problems of machine failures, high operation costs, and inefficient landfill operation are absolutely going to not just increase, but maybe even go out of control if your machines aren't the right type, if they're not sized correctly, and then most of all, if is not reliable. Again, this is all second nature to most of us. It's It's obvious in a way but sometimes it slips away. And it, just for review, the primary purpose of a landfill compactor is, a, is to obtain the highest density possible for the type of material you're gonna be compacted. Landfill compactors are designed to compress and shred material. Uh, they're, you know, bounce over the material as if you're squeezing a piece of paper in your hand and gonna throw it to the trash. The more you squeeze it, the easier it is to control, the less rebound you have. Uh, and they're designed to cover the highest possible area in the shortest amount of time because they're big wide wheels and in both right and left, or if some compactors, it's just one big long drum. The primary purpose of a dozer is to push material. It's the most efficient machine on the planet for pushing and spreading material. There's, and you know, put any name brand you want on it. Uh, there's just nothing better than a dozer for pushing and spreading. That's what they're designed for. However, they're very efficient at compacting because they're thin or they're uh, narrow tracks and uh, they don't cover a lot of surface area. So one of the things we've all got to realize is waste and soil are totally different, okay? When we're thinking dirt, seven tons of dirt is only six cubic yards of material. 
uh, 2275 pounds per cubic yard is very little. A small dozer can push that sometimes in one load. Whereas a comp, uh, waste, I'm sorry, you take seven tons of waste and it's five times the material to push for the same amount of weight. So with waste, we all have to realize it's volume. It's very light material. So seven tons compared to six cubic yards of dirt is 30 cubic yards of material. You need more passes, a larger blade, it's harder to control. And it's very, very different in traction. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit of uh, coefficient of traction is a, you know, COT. It's, it's a term engineers like to use. Uh, maybe most of everybody online here would know what it means, but it's basically how much percentage of the power getting to the ground are you actually using to move? When you're on dry earth in a dozer or even a compactor for that matter, um, you're using 90% of your available power that's down on the ground at the bottom of the wheel or the bottom of the tracks. 90% of that power grabs a hold of the dry packed earth and you're utilizing it for power. Whereas with waste, you're very lucky to be utilizing 40% of your available power of the available torque at the bottom of the wheels or the tracks. Usually, it, well, it would be in the average between 20 and 40. It's about 30%. So power, when you're moving waste, isn't always the answer. Speed and power combined is what you should probably be trying to look at because you're going to waste all of the extra tractive power, the, the horsepower available at the bottom of the wheels or on the material. You're only going to use 30% of what's available. So. Uh, understand that. Don't just buy a lot of horsepower and end up all you're doing is paying for uh, extra fuel and you're not getting that much more work out of it. So summarizing, picking the right machine is you got to understand what you want. What is the most important thing in your situation? Is it handling the inbound loads? Now keep the tr trucks moving, keep the register, the till ringing, keep the money, the revenue coming in. Or is it gaining density and saving the life of the landfill? Almost every landfill I've ever been to, uh, I get both of those answers. If I go to the owner of the landfill, if it's private or even the municipality and you know the people who are responsible for the life of that landfill, it's always density. You go out to the landfill and you talk to uh, the supervisors and the people that are you know struggling day in and day out with the weather and everything, and you ask what's important to them, they're gonna say, keeping those truck drivers happy, keeping them moving. Uh, so you gotta balance that. You gotta know what you want because there is gonna be a trade-off. Um, we have proven through a lot of different studies over time and just in my 23 years doing nothing but landfill compactors in uh, the waste industry, only 30 to 35% of the compactors day of the work hours is used for compacting when that compactor is doing all the work by itself. 65 to 70%, the reciprocal is uh, the time the compactor is spent pushing and spreading. And it's time and time and time again. It takes a long time to go out, grab a load, bring it up to the face, and then spread it and compact it three, four times, whatever you want. And then you gotta go all the way back and get another load. Uh, that takes about 65% of your day. Uh, so understand that if you're working alone, um, it takes a lot of time. And then evaluation of all your equipment, um, it, it varies. It's, it's just not one solution as I was just talking. You, know, you can get a huge compactor, very heavy. You might get good densities, but you'll never be able to get the material spread. Uh, you need the quickness of a smaller compactor, maybe just for no other reason, going out and getting it and bringing it back, especially if you're not dealing with tippers or walking floors. If you're just dealing with residential trucks, a smaller compactor might work fine for you. Um, you know, All the factors are important, but you need to itemize the ones that are most important for your isolated area, for you to make sure that you're happy with your business and your decisions. Uh, don't make it in isolation. You know, we're all here in Swana right now. You guys meet, we all meet. 
um, discuss the stuff, you know. It's always great to see what kind of scotch we all like or what's your favorite uh, micro brew. Um, but, you know, ask, uh, what do you use to push? What do you use to compact? Uh, how many trucks come in? You know, you guys probably do a good job of that now. Uh, this presentation I'm giving to you, I present around the world, and it's not so obvious to them. Um, and then you got to really understand what you must do. What do you have to do? Well, every landfill has to push and spread. But what would be nice to do? Well, I'd like to get four passes, spread it you know, 18 inches thick. Uh, I'd like to have uh, another machine to do road maintenance. I'm gonna have to dig leachate, you know, clean out leachate ponds or dig trenches for gas lines. Uh, understand what's, what's nice and understand what you have to do and buy your machines, equip yourself, primarily with what you have to do, what what's you got to do. But just understand there's not one best fit for, you know, in Oregon as compared to California, as compared to Massachusetts. You know, it, it's going to vary no matter where you're at. Machine weight. This one is a big one. Everybody thinks the heavier the machine, um, the more density I'm going to get. Well, weight slows you down too. If you're pushing your limits every day um, and you just can't seem to get the job completed every single day, it might be your, your machine's too heavy for the job you need. Here, in this case, it's we uh, simulated five Caterpillar 836s and each one of them in our Caterpillar simulator uh, is a thousand pounds heavier than the next. So as you see the, the bottom machine there in real time through our simulator, now all these are configured exactly the same with the exception of weight. Uh, you can see how slow going up a four to one slope that top machine is in only, well, it's coming up on one minute here in seven seconds. So you can see it, it lags way behind. Well, that over a period of a day, month and year is a lot of coverage. You're going to, it's going to end up, you're going to lose 25 and a quarter days for a quarter mile an hour. Again, I'll go back to that. If you can see that, I don't know what's showing up on your screen, but it's a quarter mile of an hour there, 2.74 miles per hour. That's with rolling resistance and everything. That's your daily average speed for the heaviest machine compared to the light. It's hard to see a quarter mile an hour, it really is. But boy, over a period of a year, that's 25 lost days, 3,000, <coughs> excuse me, 3,000 machine passes and 625 miles. Well, 625 miles in one year, you know, you're looking at what, 3,000, excuse me, 3,000 miles over the life of those wheels and tips. That's a lot of distance you're losing. Distance is compaction passes. Um, so we're gonna get into a, just a very, very high level of best practices now, just for, to, for the sake of time to get you thinking. One of the biggest problems, the biggest bottlenecks of a landfill is pushing. We already talked about that. When it's your uh, slow period, you know, the, the times of the day where you have extra time, push your trash farthest away from the tipper, from the tipping floor. Go out far away when it's slow because it gives you more time to go more distance. Whereas if you're in your peak periods and the trash is coming in, fill up close to the tipping floor, fill up, you know, Push the trash just on the toe of the working face and start spreading it immediately. Get get over it three, four times, get back, push again. And then when it slows down, again, take the trash from the tipping floor beyond, push it right over the top of what you've just been compacting and push it out as far away as, your, as the back edge of the tipping face will allow you to go. <clears throat> work your flow and your distance, well, work your distance comparable with your flow. And passes, we all talk four wheel pass, four pass coverage that's going up and back. And a lot of people think it's going up and back four times and it's not true. On the four wheeled machines anyway, you take your first pass forward and there the darker brown is your right and left wheel. 
and then you come back. That's two passes. So both wheels have just supplied two passes. You move over one wheel with immediately and go up and back. And then you can see your trailing two wheels is past three and four. Your front two wheels is past one and two. So you're going up, back, over, up, back, over. You try to keep in a straight line. Uh, the operator can see directly in front of the front of the machine, knows exactly where you were just at, moves over. You get full pass coverage, less hydraulic power, less wear and tear on the machine, and consistent. And as you go across, and then you just start over, you come back and the dozer, if you're working in a team, the dozer is spreading behind you as you're moving across. Now this one here, um, I always say there's three things I don't like to talk about in mixed company, especially when drinking, is um, at a bar at night you know, with other people. <laughs> is I don't talk about politics, I don't talk about religion, uh, because both of those are highly opinionated and chances are nobody's going to change my mind or I'm not going to change anybody else's mind. Uh, there's not a lot of facts uh, behind who's right, who's wrong, what religion is the right one or not. Well, the third thing I don't like to talk about is whether to push uphill or downhill because it's very, it's the same. A lot of uh, opinions um, you know, everybody says, well, that's the way we've always done it, or I'm trying to go downhill and use gravity. Well, in this case, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. I'm going to say, let's work it flat. And then everybody says, well, I can't work flat. I, you know, I'm working slopes. I'm building a mountain. Well, over time, we have proved that that's not necessarily the case. You spread it flat in the morning, or and then you compact it, you put another layer on top of it, you put another layer on top of it, you're building your slope. And then at the end of the day, you level that out to your three to one or your four to one, and you have your entire face working flat all day long. The does are feeding you in the flat, spreading it in the flat and running over it in the flat. Let the dozer do the uphill or downhill. This is working very well around the world. And it's picking up. Maybe somebody in here is already doing it. Uh, it's not anything new. It's just so showing a simulation of how to utilize gravity. All equipment manufacturers uh, design their machines, including us, to work with gravity pushing straight down on the machine. So it's even gravity on the front wheels, even gravity on the back wheels. Um, if you're pushing uphill, most machines are heavier in the back a little bit. So as you're pushing uphill, the the gravity on top of the extra machine weight is really loading down the rear of the machine to the point that a lot of times it spins, uh, it just augers down into the trash. Uh, pushing downhill, um, you know, you got gravity fighting you going uphill in reverse. Gravity is always going to fight you 50% of the time. If you can work in the flat position or, you know, six to one, five to one, when I say flat, the machines are just more productive and you're utilizing them the way they were designed. Okay, so finally, take the right time to pick the right machine. You know, understand what you have to do. Write down everything that you've got to do before you go to purchase another machine, how fast you want to do it and how well you want to do it. And then write down everything else that would be nice and hopefully you'll find something that, you know, that'll do it all. Uh, but if not, then understand, you know, the trade-offs. Configuration differences within the same machine. You know, maybe weight isn't going to be your friend. Maybe you've got to really work the machines hard and fast all day long. Uh, you know, you might want a lighter configuration, lighter blade, lighter wheels. Uh, just don't configure it so heavy. Or weight is true. You know, you're not burdened all day long every day. You do have the time to go a quarter mile an hour slower. Uh, you know, then weight could work in your advantage. You are putting a little bit more pressure on the trash. And you, as long as you continue to make the same amount of passes, it could work good for you. But understand that. And then this is the biggest one that I tell people around the world. Uh, don't be afraid to try something new. Uh, you know, if you don't try any new ideas or a different way of operation, you better like the way it's going today because nothing's ever going to change. 
we're building landfills. We're not building dams. We're not building skyscrapers or highways. Um, try something. If it don't work, oh, okay, go back to the way you were doing or try something different. Uh, you can always go back to the way you're doing it with a landfill. It's never too late. <clears throat> but when you try something new, I try to recommend to people go a week because people can't change their habits in an hour or a day or even a couple of days, but they can change their habits over a week of 40, 50 hours in a machine. They can get used to something and see if it makes a difference. Um, it, it, it really does. All right, so there, I got through it hopefully in time. Um, <clears throat> there's our contact information. Uh, I am retiring and Travis Schwark, who is online listening right now, will be my replacement. He's been working with me for three years. I figure it's ready. I'm ready to hand over the reins to him and let him take off with it. Uh, and then we also have Clay Lane, our sales support consultant in Peoria, Illinois. Clay, for those who are online and know uh, uh, another old timer, a friend of mine was Tom Griffith. He retired a year and a half ago and Clay has replaced him. So. Us old timers are making way for the new regime to come in. <laughs> Thank and you, with Mark. That, that is there any questions? Uh, well, there aren't any questions typed in here. And since we're running a little tight on time, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Eric. But thank you very much. And uh, if there are questions in the next few minutes, um, people can put that into the chat room. But um, I really appreciate your time, um, Mark. It was very interesting. Now it's uh, Eric uh, is going to tell us. Eric, well, thank you. Tell us. Thank you. Good afternoon, thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Miller. I'm with uh, Butte County. I'm in Northern California. I'm the manager of the Neil Road Landfill uh, for uh, up north here. And just so Mark knows, we push both uphill and downhill. Let's go to the next slide. For the, uh, and thanks for your help, Cecilia, in, in advancing these. Uh, what we'll discuss today are the effects of the campfire on our site. I'll describe the event, the local impacts on the site and the community how the Neil Road Recycling and Waste Facility rebounded, unintended consequences, and some lessons learned. Next slide. So for those of you not familiar with our part of the world, uh, Butte County is located about 90 miles or so north of Sacramento. Our population pre-campfire uh, was 230,000. It is now uh, just under 200,000, and we have five incorporated cities. Next. Uh, the conditions on this particular event, uh, thanks to our weather, <laughs> California, uh, like many of you, uh, especially east of Interstate 25, <laughs> which runs in the middle of the United States, would know that the West and the specific, uh, uh, specifically the Pacific West has in, endured many drought years in recent years. From the period 2010 to 2018, we had five or six drought years within that time frame. The area in our county includes valley lands and national forest land uh, in the valley, largely agricultural forest. We've got uh, well trees and a, a dense forest canopy and uh, heavy undergrowth. Pacific Gas and Electric Company has transmission lines north and south and east and west throughout our county. Um, in May of that year uh, was our last recorded rainfall at our site and we had no rain for six months after uh, five, you know, very eight year dry periods of, of uh, uh, climate. Uh, summer days are typically in the 100 to 105 degree range. Uh, and on November 8th, which was a Thursday, we had high winds uh, reaching up to 50 miles an hour and parched conditions. So this is uh, uh, an image of uh, the campfire as it is north and east of our site. And you see the town of Paradise in the middle of the screen. Next slide. Uh, the town of Paradise and other rural communities took a direct hit from the campfire. Uh, it was just a terrible event. Uh, the fire consumed over 150,000 acres. More than 50,000 people were uh, evacuated or affected in some manner. Uh, nearly 18,000 structures were destroyed. There were 88 fatalities. And the burn rate through the, system, uh, through the forest and through the town and communities uh, peaked at about 80 acres per minute. Next slide. Uh, our facility is seven miles away from Paradise. Uh, we've been open for 51 years. We serve all of Butte County. We're publicly operated uh, pre-campfire conditions. And we're back to normal conditions now, but about 700 tons per day facility. 
for municipal solid waste. Uh, we have a two megawatt landfill gas to energy power plant on site. And our anticipated site life is in the late 2040s or early uh, 2050s. Next slide. Uh, here's an aerial view of the near road landfill. You'll see in the pink, the closed modules one, two, and three. Uh, module four is the, the purple uh, picture. Uh, that's an active uh, waste module right now. Module five in yellow is currently active now also. But the whole acreage is approximately 200 uh, acres in area. And you can see that there is grassland to the north and east of us. Next slide. This was the view of the campfire uh, uh, before noon on the morning of November 8th. Uh, the smoke was just thick and dark. Um, and uh, many of my crew live up in that area. Uh, if you can uh, vaguely see some headlights uh, uh, in, in the image, uh, those were thousands of vehicles uh, fleeing uh, the town of Paradise. But that was the initial view. The temperature that day was 42 degrees on site, and I, I did some weather research. It was 75 degrees uh, outside of the smoke plume area. So it was very cold and very eerie. Next slide. Uh, here's, uh, we got permission with the landowners north and east of us to uh, uh, take some dozers and cut some fire lines. So we did a four lane fire line, uh, but there's a real surreal image. Uh, two of our crew were, were doing that. Next slide. Uh, we also irrigated the top uh, closed area of the landfill. Our grass was pretty short, uh, be, be, between your ankle uh, and knee, but shorter than that. And in my hand there is, uh, the, the type of the debris that was falling from the sky. So that was somebody's house or roof or, or something. And these are the kinds of problems that created a, 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 the large scale disaster. Next slide. Uh, the next morning, uh, this is November 9th, a Friday. Uh, this is what we encountered. Uh, my boss and I, I see that he was uh, online, Todd Story. So hello, Todd. Uh, he's now with somebody else. But uh, the, the, the closed area burned and uh, it looks like Mars there. And I think we might have another image. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, after the smoke cleared a little bit. It, it, it took over uh, two weeks or so for the smoke to clear. But we found uh, over two miles of uh, gas collection system lines and oversight storm drain completely destroyed. And so uh, we ran around and uh, filled up a pickup truck with 30 fire extinguishers or whatever it was and just went around put, uh, putting out spot fires. Next slide. So the overall site damage, you can see on the image on the left, uh, the area in the red is the area that was burned. The top uh, plateau or of our closed area survived it uh, with the water uh, truck application helped. We did as much as we could with what we had at the time. But over two miles of uh, HDEP pipe was destroyed. We lost uh, 35 to 37 uh, extra, uh, vertical gas wells and had damaged uh, uh, leachate collection system. We lost power for 10 days. We had no internet for a month and uh, half of my crew was evacuated and one third of the crew had lost their homes. And uh, we did open three days later to partial operations. Uh, the community still needed a landfill. And so we opened up uh, uh, crippled, but we were functional. Next slide. The first weeks, uh, hats off to our consulting team that uh, responded very quickly. Uh, Golder Associates, Blue Ridge Services, SCS Engineers, Fuji Civil Engineering, they were all technical and moral support <laughs> throughout the initial process and, and they continue to be so to this day. We also had many visits from our local enforcement agency, um, Cal Recycle, California Regional Water Quality Control Board, uh, our regulators, and the California Office of Emergency Services, FEMA. And then we had an army of insurance agents uh, stopping in uh, over the course of the next several months. But it was well over $2 million worth of damage to the site. Next slide. Our priorities uh, at the time were to assess the, the extent of the damage. There was a lot of boots on the ground at work. We used downhill video. We did thermal infrared camera imaging to find out if there were fires inside the closed area. Um, then we uh, also looked at uh, what are we gonna do with uh, fire debris? Should we be expected to receive it? So we developed preliminary field sequencing plans to accept that and our related industrial health 
uh, safety plans for that. We developed solicitations for contract and repair work for our oversight storm drain our, uh, and our gas collection system and work closely with the regulators in getting uh, permit variances to, to uh, increase the tonnage received, traffic, uh, animal carcasses, extended hours, those sorts of things. And we didn't have enough uh, horsepower on the ground, so we developed the labor scope to hire a third uh, party independent contractor. And so that required a lot of meetings with the crew and with unions. And uh, we had un unlimited overtime for our crew, but quite frankly, half of them were living in trailers or hotels or friends, and they just didn't have the energy to do it. Next slide. Uh, fire debris contract operations began in April of 2019. We had some private loads come in uh, through private contractors after they were cleared uh, in late January, but the, the big brunt of the fire debris acceptance began in April of 2019. Next slide. Uh, just to compare our normal operations with how we transition to fire debris operations, with the uh, third uh, shift, uh, our normal close time is at 4 p.m. We would start uh, ramping up with the, the third crew. We had extra equipment. We uh, <laughs> dozers, uh, predominantly D8s and D6s to place and push uh, the fire debris. Uh, normal operations were open every day. We continued everyday operations, but we only accepted fire debris Monday through Friday with extended hours to 7.30 p.m. Our tonnage ramped up from a current status of 600 tons per day. We peaked at 12,000 tons per day, and we peaked at about 4,000 vehicles per day. We put in two new scales, uh, started renting them, and then we ended up buying them. And uh, at, uh, at the, to get this really going, we had two inbound scales and two outbound scales, and we had a designated disposal area on top of module four. So the cleanup uh, occurred uh, nearly a year, April 2019 to February 2020. Next slide. Here's an image of uh, Cal OES fire debris contractors. Our inbound lanes were pretty much three lanes wide. Uh, we funneled into two. A third lane was used to detarp uh, the loads and have the loads inspected and have the driver, each load and each driver was tied to a parcel number for uh, you know, an address that burned down. Roughly uh, six to eight of these 10-wheeler uh, trucks uh, carried one property's uh, remnants of <laughs> their property. It's kind of sobering. Next slide. We had many logistical challenges, uh, of course, traffic backups on Neal Road. Also, uh, we had traffic uh, issues on Highway 99, which is just west of us, a state highway uh, south of Chico and uh, uh, north of, of Marysville. Uh, we were one of uh, three landfills that received campfire debris, uh, the other two landfills in Yuba County to the south and to uh, Shasta County in the north. Uh, both those sites are privately operated, but uh, the remnants uh, and the ramifications of the campfire debris cleanup was pretty huge on, on several different counties. Our goal was to process trucks every 40 seconds or less because there was a lot of paperwork to keep track of for Cali, Cal OES and FEMA and also for the insurance companies that would represent each parcel. We also had concurrent simultaneous repairs in our leachate, uh, stormwater, landfill gas infrastructure, and also we're building module five and also decommissioning uh, the second of our uh, last two septage ponds. So the site was very, very busy. Next slide. Um, understand if you were in a state or an area of the United States prone to hurricanes or wildfire or whatever have you, uh, accepting that debris waste uh, comes with some risk. Uh, in our case, not realizing what the, uh, the, the consistency of the waste would look like, um, we weren't quite sure what that meant because we hadn't crossed that bridge yet. Uh, in reality, uh, the waste coming in uh, from the Paradise and related communities, very heavy soil, very clayey soil. It came in at nearly a ton per cubic yard uh, and mixed with rebar, metal, and a little bit of construction and demolition waste. Most of that stuff was destroyed, but still we had wood fragments and two by fours and things like that. The loads were wrapped in plastic, um, uh, which, which we didn't know could create another potential problem for us in the future. The actual mass of the waste itself crushed uh, several landfill gas wells inside of module four, which we had to repair uh, and replace. We did that last summer. 
We had two weeks after the campfire, we were hit by the first of three major storms, and that gave us uh, problems associated with seeps and stormwater um, uh, issues uh, related to those seeps. So in, the in 2019 and 2020, we spent a lot of money. We made a, a good revenue on the fire debris, but we spent a lot of money to reconcile some of these problems. Expanding our gas collection landfill gas, gas system, we bolstered uh, soil erosion best management practices, uh, put potty shell in the side slopes, deepened uh, uh, sedimentation ponds, um, and improved our, our overall system. Uh, and in this summer, we're gonna add 11 more gas wells to the top of Mount Four. All together, the campfire debris consumed uh, nearly two years of airspace. Next slide. Uh, those that are in landfill operations, uh, we get blamed for a lot of problems um, from people that don't understand what we do. Uh, we are expected to have x-ray vision. We are expected to know what's exactly in the hill and where is it. And we're expected to know how much it's gonna rain two weeks from now uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, all this to say, anticipate challenges. When we were out of power for 10 days, we uh, had so many things going wrong. Uh, when power was turned on, it, it, it turned on our leachate pumps and we had a leachate spill, which we didn't recognize before because uh, the leachate, we had many leachate lines that destroyed and uh, then the power suddenly comes on, uh, but we fixed that. Uh, we had over 37 inches of rain from late November, the two weeks after the fire through uh, the rest of that water year. We did not anticipate getting over three feet of rain in an area that normally receives 24 inches of rain annually. Uh, from November 2018 to summer 19, our power plant was offline as we were rebuilding the gas well system. Uh, we were investigating the site further in the summer of 2019 and discovered fire damage to the upper liner of module four, which was uh, above the placement of waste, but we were able to reconnect some, um, some of our gas well system to get back on partial uh, load. In fall of 2019, uh, some of our remedies to control seeps created another problem. Uh, uh, we put in essentially a, a trenching, backfilled with block to collect a, a leachate, and it, but that corrective action for one water issue created an air emissions issue as, uh, as methane were, was passively able to migrate from those seeps, so we had to fix that. Uh, last summer, we installed 11 more wells, the power plants on full load, and the uh, liner damage on module four has since been repaired, and we do have uh, more work to do this summer. And then this thing is practically uh, um, a clean slate. Next slide. Uh, all that to say, um, there were a lot of things we could not control in this situation, uh, but the things we could control included our own team, our own staff, our engineers, our contractors. Uh, um, and uh, once we started knocking out these projects, the list of things that, that we could control became, lo became longer than the things that we could not control. Uh, so I'd be happy to relay this uh, presentation to anybody who'd like, uh, there's my contact information. And I think I'm just about on time. So thank you for allowing me to share. Very well done, everyone. Uh, thank you for those really interesting presentations. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat room, so I'm assuming you're all mesmerized by all this information. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, we're, we are at the top of the hour. We're going to head and terminate the presentation. Um, yes, thank you very much to all the speakers. It was very interesting. A lot of good stuff.